This is one of the most serious issues facing Israel today. International law is a term that is so often used when people talk about Israel in connection with Judea and Samaria. We're repeatedly told by people in the highest places, including supposed friends, that Israel's presence in what they like to call the West Bank and our activities there are not legitimate. It is illegal, we are told, we are warned, to build towns and villages in Judea and Samaria and even homes in parts of Jerusalem and there are other issues. Now I'm no lawyer, let alone expert on international law. But as a person able to see that 2 plus 2 usually equals 4, and after carefully reading and rereading relevant documents, as I'm sure many of you have, my common sense tells me that these accusations of illegal actions by Israel are questionable, to say the least, and seem to be based on ignorance or intentional disregard for relevant historical facts and a very narrow, particularistic reading of international agreements and conventions. But then I realize, I remember, <laughs> I am no expert on international law and I'm also biased. Yeah, I'm biased. Who isn't biased one way or another? And bias, as we all know, can lead us to indulge in all kinds of mental shenanigans. So in the tradition of the quintessential Jew, I ask myself questions. Is there something else that I don't know or should know? Am I ignoring something or simply kidding myself in order to justify what I'd like to believe that everything we do is indeed legally kosher? Yeah? After all, if so many people say we are breaking international law, then maybe we are. So what do you do when you have questions like that? You ask an expert. And that's what we've done. We've asked Yona Jeremy Bob, who's an expert on international law, to explain things to us. <coughs> By the way, tonight we are not discussing, we are not discussing whether holding on to Judea and Samaria and building towns and villages there is the right thing to do pragmatically or politically. Please remember that tonight it's just international law that we're dealing with. So Yona is going to explain the issues and the facts, whatever pros and cons there are, and he's going to do so clearly and in terms that the average person can understand. And afterwards, if there are any questions, and I'm sure there will be, we can ask him. And with the knowledge and insight that we should get this evening, either we'll have to concede that Israel might possibly be breaking some international laws, or that Israel is actually incontrovertibly and unmitigatedly in breach. And if this is so, we might have to draw some personal conclusions. But on the other hand, if we learn that we are not in breach of any international laws, especially when taking into consideration Israel's unique position as a state repeatedly threatened and attacked by its neighbors, and if we find that international law when honestly assessed, when honestly and fairly assessed actually works in Israel's favor, then if this is so, 
we'll have a much better chance of countering the global accusations against Israel. If the charge of illegality is disingenuous and false, if it is based on lies, then we must expose the falsehood and counter it and debunk it with all our power and with all the means at our disposal as individuals and collectively. And many of you are already doing so. I wish we could rely on the government to do a proper job, but clearly we can't. So we have a big job on our hands. We care about Israel and about our survival. So as individuals, we're out there communicating in many different ways to set the record straight, especially among those who have little sympathy for us and also with those who have influence. And in order to do this hallowed work effectively, we ourselves must have a good grasp of all the relevant historical and legal facts. And that's why we've come here tonight. That's why Hazel, Hazel, my wife, yeah, yeah she's in the back there, yeah. Uh, that's why Hazel and I have this series of talks on setting the record straight. There's also a need to know, in the words of Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. How do we explain things clearly and convincingly? How to reach out to people and get them at least to candidly consider the validity of what you're saying and question the validity of their own opinions and attitudes? Now, this is a crucial subject for at least one or more talks in the future, yeah? and we will have such talks. But right now, we've come to hear the verdict on international law and Israel. Yona Jeremy Bob graduated in law uh, at Oxford, you know, at Oxford, I beg your pardon, Jeremy, at Boston University. Yeah, I have a brother in law from Oxford. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy graduated at Boston University, specializing in international relations and international law. Since the year 2000, he's lectured in the United States, Canada, and Israel. He's worked for the IDF International Legal Division and the Israeli Embassy to Israel. He's worked for the IDF International Legal Division. So he knows what he's talking about. Many of you know uh, him from his clear, comprehensive articles on legal matters that appear regularly in the Jerusalem Post. I now ask Yon uh, Jeremy Bob to set the record straight for us. So, uh, first thing I have to say is I'm not going to be giving a verdict today. That's for all of you uh, to make. Um, and behind all of this is why does international law matter at all? I, I spent a lot of time writing about international law, and I try not to look at talkbacks too much. You have to have really, really tough skin to look at talkbacks about your own articles. Um, but whenever I write about international law, the first talkback is usually who cares? You know, why, why, you know, we have to do uh, what we have to do regardless of what international law says. So I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but my big answer for tonight is because Raphael Dobrin said it matters, and all of you came here tonight. Um, most of uh, what I'm going to talk about, though, is really sort of laying out, um, to some extent, uh, both sides. Um, I'm not going to say what should happen in Judea and Samaria. Uh, people use Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, the occupied territories. The Israeli government uses Judea and Samaria in its official documents. That's what I'm going to try to use tonight um, with the settlements. I'm a news journalist, so I write news reports. I do write analyses, which sometimes gets to, you know, what, what's a little bit more that happened in the news that you couldn't get in the news report, and predicting what is going to happen. But I'm not a columnist, so I will not tell you, as I said, what you should think um, about all of this. In terms of summarizing both sides, um, Rafi said unbiased summary, so I'm going to be giving an unbiased summary. I was given the impression that there's an interest here in really fully knowing what all of the, let's say, pro-legal uh, settlement 
arguments are. I will also be giving to some extent for context what some of the anti-legal settlement arguments are. Um, but I'm not going to do a full uh, job on that. For anybody who wants a complete, uh, the complete full argument, all the anti-legal settlement arguments, there's an uh, NGO called Yesh Din that did a report a few months ago um, that fully, uh, fully covers that issue. I'll be drawing on a, a wide range of sources from my reading on the topic over about 20 years and as a lawyer and a journalist over about 10 years, um, about four of which were working for the Israeli government or the IDF. Um, and I'm going to draw significantly on the July 2012 uh, Levy report that, that some of you have heard of. That's a report that was put out by uh, former Supreme Court Justice Edmund Levy, Alan Baker, who is, was the former head of the legal division in the foreign ministry, Tchia Shapira, who was the former deputy president of the Tel Aviv District Court. Um, it's one of the most recent documents, the most updated documents on the issue. Um, it includes Oslo's impact on all the legal issues. It addresses the international uh, criminal court's impact to some extent on some of the issues. Uh, but I'm not going to be endorsing or rejecting uh, the Levy report tonight, which the Israeli government also has neither um, endorsed or rejected uh, the report at any point in time officially. Okay, we're going to start with the pre-UN. This is not talked about as much, um, but it definitely was a, a big point in the Levy report. And there's two big reasons why if you're arguing the yes, the settlements could be considered uh, legal under international law, you would talk about this. One would be to boost the debate on probably the biggest legal issue uh, that's talked about, which is the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions of 1949 is probably where most people argue about when they're talking about international law and the settlements. Um, so basically, boosting the pro-Israel side in addressing what the significance of the Geneva Convention would be. And we'll talk about the Geneva Convention a little bit later. The other reason is on its own terms, uh, that the pre-UN history, uh, legal history has some value. Um, that even if you take, uh, there's two ways to read the 1949 Geneva Convention. So even if you take the side of reading the Geneva Convention, which most of the world takes, uh, which is uh, declaring the settlements not to be legal, even if you take that position, one could argue that the pre-UN uh, legal documents and history um, can reduce the impact of uh, that argument, offset uh, the power of that argument. We start with the 1917 Balfour Declaration. I'll quote a little bit from it. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Some see this as basically just a nice prelude, basically legal fluff. Uh, you know, England looks with favor on uh, the rights of uh, the Jews uh, in the area, but it's not necessarily a deed for the land from the whole world. The other perspective, um, I'm going to start with what I would say would be the most, the strongest pro-legality perspective, uh, would be represented by a man named Dr. Jacques uh, Gautier. There are other people who argue it, but I interviewed him uh, uh, recently, and he has a long uh, thesis, 1,200 pages with 3,200 3, footnotes. Um, mostly about uh, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, but also a lot of the arguments can be applied um, in Judea and Samaria. Um, he's also an interesting man because he's Christian, he's not Jewish, and he got interested in, th in all of these legal issues um, in 1982, 1983 when he first visited Israel. So Gauthier talks about the Balfour Declaration of 1917, but really what he says is the central point in all of this pre-UN history, and in his opinion, overall, in terms of everything that comes to play, is the San Remo Conference of 1920, specifically April 24th and 25th. So the conference was a continuation of earlier gatherings held by the victors of World War I to determine, basically, borders and how they were going to run things afterwards. Um, Gautier says that basically the, the 24th and 25th of April were basically the final hearing by effectively the world court that existed at the time. Uh, the count, the five leading nations, the victors of World War I. And he saw it all in terms of it being a case, that basically the Jewish side submitted legal arguments to title, the Arab side submitted legal arguments to title. 
um, starting with the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, um, and that by April 24th, 25th, Gautier calls it the key defining moment in history on all of these issues. Um, he quoted Chaim Weizmann, who said that it was the most important moment for, Jewish, for the Jewish people since the exile. Uh, basically, they, he says they ruled in favor of the Jews. They said they, they accepted all of the Jewish claims, um, whether with regard to standing to be recognized as a people under the law of nations, reconstituting Jewish historic rights, um, the, full, the full argument. Um, and the way he looked at it is basically, I don't know if there are any real estate lawyers here, but in real estate law, sometimes you might have five different claims to title on a particular land. And it's not like other areas where just because everybody has a claim, they all get a piece or they're all equal. Sometimes one of them is just completely right, and the others are completely uh, deficient. So that's his opinion on the issue of the significance of uh, that moment, April 24th, 25th, in uh, 1920. Um, and he goes on to talk about that all of this was supported by Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which basically says we're setting up a trusteeship, um, a sacred trust, un sacred trust until the people, the Jews, are un ready on their own to stand on their own feet. Um, the implication being, the British are here. There's a mandate now, but at some point, the the Jews under the San Remo Conference and the Balfour Declaration would take over. Um, and Gautier basically says everything that comes later, whether it's the UN resolutions, um, the Oslo Accords, all of those things um, are less important than what happened at that moment. Um, some of his proof for this comes from the UN Charter a famous, and a famous International Court of Justice case um, about West Africa or Namibia, which basically s upholds the earlier uh, decisions of the League of Nations. I'm just going to read a couple of passages from the San Remo Conference, April 25th, 1920. The principal allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory, that's uh, England, should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917, we're talking about the Balfour Declaration, and adopted by the said powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine, same language of a national home for the Jewish people. By the way, there were some that were upset with this language. They wanted to say the uh, national home for the Jewish people as opposed to a national home for the Jewish people. But, uh, that's uh, one side point. Um, again, and it talks about clearly understood that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights. So arguments from the legality of the settlement side say, look, it protected the natives, whether you want to call them Palestinians or Arabs, whatever you want to call them. Um, civil and religious rights, but not their political sovereign rights uh, to the land, that it gave uh, to the Jews. So that's uh, that interpretation. Similar language in section two of the British Mandate, July 1922. Basically, the League of Nations approves what was decided in San Remo at the earlier date, um, that the mandatory is going to be responsible um, for securing the establishment of the, the Jewish national home as laid down in the preamble, again also for safeguarding the civil and religious rights of all of the inhabitants of Palestine. Section 6 of the, of the British Mandate, the administration of Palestine while ensuring that the rights and position of other sections of the population are not prejudiced, shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions, shall encourage in cooperation with the Jewish agency, referred to in Article 4, close settlement by Jews on the land. This is probably one of the biggest uh, statements of, of all of these because it not only talks about Jewish rights in the area, but it talks about you know, the verbiage, close settlement, encouraging uh, immigration, um, very strong language. Um, and finally, we come to 1945, Article 80, Paragraph 1 of the United Nations Charter. Except as may be agreed upon in individual trusteeship agreements, nothing in this chapter shall be construed in or after to alter in any manner the rights whatsoever of any states of any peoples on the terms of existing international instruments. That's supposed to refer to the League of Nations and everything that we just talked about. So perspectives on all of this. Um, one perspective is um, that basically you have the Jewish rights established in the Balfour Declaration, San Remo, the British Mandate is all upheld by the UN Charter. The other side would say, look, it's not that simple because you also have, uh, when the Balfour Declaration was made as a promise, you also have the Hussein McMahon promise that was made to the Arabs. You also have the Sykes-Picot Agreement that was made between the British and the French. And basically really what was going on was the British were promising everything to everybody. All they really cared about was not anybody's particular rights, but 
how could they best balance all the forces so they could maintain control of the country as, as long as possible and as much as possible. That would be a, a counter argument. Um, breaking down basically the perspectives on all of these issues, let's say Gautier, and he, he's not a singular person, there are other people who have said what Gautier says would be, I'd say, the most strongest uh, pro-legality uh, opinion on it. The Levy report doesn't see all of this stuff as single-minded. In other words, the Levy report doesn't say that because of these pre-UN documents, the story is over. It sees them as significant and helpful in terms of other things that also happen later, um, and it makes a big deal about them, but not to the same extent, let's say, as Gautier. And then there's, there's the Israeli government and the high court, which are much more ambiguous. Um, they may talk about these issues, again, as supportive arguments, um, but because one of the primary ideas for the Israeli government and the high court is to maintain openness in political negotiations. Um, you know, getting into exactly whether Israel wins the legal argument or doesn't win the legal argument usually is considered less important uh, when they're making that position for the Israeli government and the high court. Um, you know, so they'll recognize these arguments, um, but move things more to talk about you know, negotiations and uh, political compromise. Is there a downside for Israel on any of uh, what I just quoted? You could make an argument, some have made, um, is Israel stuck in a trusteeship under Article 78, which is another article um, that appears in the UN Charter, um, and that basically um, our membership in the UN almost you know, sort of blow out of the water Israel's mandate, the rights that it had beforehand. Uh, it's an argument that could be made, a response would be, no, because the U UN Resolution 181 was basically the realization of the manda mandate. That's UN Resolution 181 of the General Assembly in 1947, the Partition Plan, um, and that when the Arab, the five Arab nations rejected the borders uh, offered, um, Israel became a UN member. The whole situation was resolved by war, um, and things basically became up for grabs at the very least. But it certainly didn't blow up uh, whatever rights there were before. Um, if you were focusing on the, I made a brief reference to the Levy Report, the perspective on all of these documents. So basically, the Levy Report would take these documents and say, how does this empower Israel's argument? If you go forward with later events, so for example, the armistice agreements of 1949, the Levy Report says those aren't setting borders. Israel had sovereign rights already. Those aren't setting borders. They're just armistice lines. Come up to April 1950. Jordan annexes the West Bank. Um, Egypt did not annex Gaza. Most countries didn't recognize Jordan's annexation. So again, the Levy Report would say we had pre-existing rights. Jordan's annexation wasn't recognized. Egypt didn't even try to do what Jordan had done in terms of annexation. So the perspective on that is Jordan's annexation doesn't do anything because of what happened in the pre-UN era. Leading up to the 1967 war, therefore, in the Levy Report argument would be Israel has a dispute with Jordan over the West Bank. No one else at that point has a dispute. And then when Jordan renounces its rights to Judea and Samaria in 1988, so basically no one else has a claim anymore against uh, the Israeli claim from the pre-existing UN days. Um, the counter argument to that would be, well, Jordan really renounced its rights because that's also the same time when the Palestinians, for the first time, uh, declared a state. Uh, that would be the counter argument. Um, Israel in negotiations, uh, so this argument from the Labor Report would say when, when we're negotiating, uh, when Israel's negotiating over land, it has never waived its full rights or sovereignty. It's just that for pragmatic, political, diplomatic purposes, it's willing to compromise um, and give land for peace in order to end hostility on the opposite side. Um, that Israel chose not to annex these areas, but there's an implication in the Labor Report that Israel could have under its legal rights. Um, and that one, the Labor Report would say you can't see Israel as a classic occupier um, because of all the pre existing history. Uh, so it never committed uh, to applying the Fourth Geneva Convention in the West Bank, even though, and this is a, a problem for the Israeli side that it has to, why this explanation has to come out. In 1951, Israel did ratify the Fourth Geneva Convention. So you could say Israel is bound by the 1951 ratification. So the argument that the Levy Report perspective would say is, no, Israel isn't bound um, because of the pre-existing uh, UN history. 
I'm going to fast forward now to uh, the UN Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949. Um, the first lesson I learned in law school 13 years ago, um, and that I've used a lot since I was a lawyer and journalist, is that there's a little limited number of arguments you can make based on a, on a text. You can make arguments from the text, from comparative texts, intent arguments, object and purpose arguments. We're going to start with the text itself, paragraph 6 of Article 49 of the Geneva, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the Geneva Conventions of 1949. The occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civil population into the territory it occupies. The plain meaning of the text is not particularly helpful to Israel. If you don't think about any of the intent, um, it's either not helpful to the argument that the settlements are legal or it's neutral. The not helpful would be, look, it says it prohibits any transfer without any qualification in this particular text. The neutral argument would be, what if the government doesn't itself transfer people? What if people voluntarily go there themselves? It's not really addressed in the text, per se, what the text would have to say about that. So the next thing we'll do is we move on to look at comparative texts. One comparative text would be the Rome Statute of 1998. The Rome Statute governs the International Criminal Court. All right? Briefly, what is the International Criminal Court? Subsequent to genocides committed both against the Jews, but more recently in the 1990s in Rwanda and other places, there finally was enough international pressure to make an international criminal court that can judge any crime against humanity, any genocide. Until then, any international war crimes courts were ad hoc in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda, in the former Yugoslavia, but it sort of you had to set them up on the spot. Um, now there's an international criminal court that can deal with all of these issues. It was established by the Rome Statute of 1998 and it started to function in 2002. Late in the negotiations over the Rome Statute, um, Israel had been a big part of the negotiations all along and had intended to sign and ratify it, but Israel dropped out at the last second. Why? The Arab states initiated a small but significant amendment to Article 82B8, that's how you get to be a lawyer when you can start quoting uh, provisions like that, which is the list of war crimes. And one of the war crimes listed there is the transfer directly or indirectly by the occupying power of parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. So if you put these two texts next to each other, the 1949 version from the Geneva Conventions and 1998 from the Rome Statute, they're the same, except there's additional language here, directly or indirectly. That's why Israel pulled out. Israel said, wait a second, there's uh, an attempt here to bring war crimes allegations against us for what's going on in the settlements. Um, and uh, Israel also, a secondary reason was concerns about uh, lawfare, uh, lawsuits against Israeli soldiers and uh, leaders in other countries, but the big thing was this issue about the settlements. Um, as a side, little known side note, if Israel does ever join the International Criminal Court, there is a little known provision that allows you to grandfather in all sorts of things that you do for the next seven years. Um, so if there is ever a peace agreement and Israel does ever sign the International Criminal Court, there's a grandfathering clause that could um, take care of near-term uh, issues. But moving on, because uh, none of that looks like it's happening tomorrow. Um, intent of the Rome Statute. So basically, um, there's um, the ICRC official commentary of 1958. The ICRC is considered one of the definitive organizations about international law. Um, and in terms of defining the Fourth Geneva Convention and that language that we were just talking about, it says it is intended to prevent a practice adopted during the Second World War by certain powers which transfer portions of their own population to occupied territory for their political and racial reasons or in order as they claim to colonize those territories. Such transfers worsen the economic situation of the native population and endangered their separate existence as a race. So this is tells us that the, according to this argument, the intent of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 was about if people are deported, forcibly, coercively sent to an area. The argument obviously is people who moved into the settlements did it voluntarily. Nobody coerced them to go. Nobody forced them to go. And according to that argument, uh, so the convention wouldn't apply. Um, if you look at things from the purpose and object of the 1949 Geneva Convention, 
40 million people were forcibly transferred and expelled around World War II, 15 million Germans, 5 million Soviets, millions of Poles, Ukrainians, and of course millions of Jews. So that's the idea is that the intent and purpose here raises questions about, yes, the plain meaning of the text seems to be either against the pro-legality argument of the settlements or at the very least neutral, but there are intent arguments and object and purpose arguments um, that can uh, defray that. Um, an argument on the other side uh, would say, look, that's very nice, um, but even if you say all of that, if you're hurting the native population, and the argument is that the settlements are hurting the native population, um, either in terms of limiting their ability to grow, pushing them off the land, limiting their ability to farm, um, defining those questions gets a lot more into politics and is very hard to get into. I'll say a very, very brief word about that at the very end. There's um, a bunch of quotes um, that are brought out in the Levy Report and some other documents. Uh, Eugene Rousteau, um, who was the former Undersecretary of State in the United States and a former dean of Yale Law School, um, said that the intent of the Geneva Conventions had to do with extermination, slave labor, colonization, and that the Jewish settlers in the West Bank are most emphatically volunteers. And uh, that, that uh, settlement involves none of the purposes or harmful effects that the Geneva Convention uh, was trying to prevent. Uh, there's another quote by Julius Stone, um, who was an international lawyer, quoted in a 2010 commentary magazine article, which basically says um, that the ultimate irony would be to be taking a text which was meant against the Nazis and then applying it against the Jews in uh, Judea and Samaria. So um, basically, summing up some of these arguments about the intent, we have the ICRC report of 1958. There's also an article by Alan Baker, who was part of the report, um, that the report quotes. Uh, there's Eugene Rousteau. Um, there's an a, uh, American ambassador, Morris Abrams, who's quoted, Julius uh, Stone. The other side says, look, this is very nice. There certainly are serious people who say this, but it selects quotations. And then if you made a list of scholars in international law um, and what they think about the intent, the overwhelming majority would be saying the opposite of this, um, and that the Levy Report is selectively quoting from the scholars that it support its side. Um, to give some context, I'm going to go through some other arguments that the uh, side that says that the settlements uh, are not legal says. Um, for one, it says Israeli courts and the IDF itself treat Judea and Samaria as if the humanitarian aspects of the Fourth Geneva Conventions and the, and the Hague Conventions apply. If that's how they act, even if the Israeli government hasn't said they apply, but if that's how they act, there are a lot of places in law where your conduct can basically send the message of what you really think and believe inside, whether you're saying it in public. Um, also, IDF orders um, are um, assembled to make this argument. The IDF order for governing um, in Judea and Samaria, Proclamation Number 3, which was enacted, um, this is the order concerning security provisions, which created the military courts in the West Bank and a lot of other authorities, says, when there is a contradiction between this order and the said convention, the Geneva Convention, the provisions of the convention take precedence. So again, it appears from some of these things that the IDF itself, um, even in its own official orders, is sending at the very least mixed messages, if not a backhanded message, that really we don't have such a strong legal argument here. Uh, there's also an internal foreign ministry opinion from 1967 from legal advisor Theodore Mayron, where he basically says it's going to be very, I've been asked to justify you know, settling uh, in, the, in the West Bank, and he says it's going to be really dis uh, difficult to justify this on an international law basis in light of the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Um, and the Israeli High Court um, itself, and I'll, uh, if there's time, I'll get into this uh, some more later, basically says w whenever um, the security barrier wall um, is, has been built in the uh, Judea and Samaria, um, and there's been arguments about whether the wall can be built or not, the court doesn't say, yes, it can be built because we do, uh, Jews do have a right to settle in Judea and Samaria, it says, for security considerations, um, which could imply that if it wasn't for security considerations, uh, maybe there isn't a strong argument for it. Uh, I want to wrap up the Geneva Convention part 
um, to move on to UN Convention 242 and some more recent stuff uh, by saying this is a very highly appropriate talk. I don't know if Rafi has uh, some prophetic powers, but on Wednesday, for the only the third time, the Geneva Conference itself is going to meet. It's only met before in 1999 and 2001. I mean, at that time, there was no state of Palestine. Um, no, nobody uh, in a serious way had recognized the state of Palestine. In contrast, in April of this year, the state of Palestine joined the Geneva Convention as a full party. So even though Palestine isn't recognized by the UN Security Council um, and various aspects of the UN still as a full member state, it is recognized by the Geneva Convention. What kind of an impact um, could this have on the whole legal argument? One could say, from the side of those saying that the settlements have legal problems, is that, okay, 1999 and 2001 were symbolic statements uh, were made against the Israeli side, but here, actually, Palestine is a state, and there's, there's no reason not to apply it. So that's, again, that's the, uh, the side that would say uh, there are legal problems. UN Convention 242 and 338, I'm only going to address these very briefly because uh, people know them more. Um, they're really the center of the conflict. Um, if anybody wants to know uh, more about the differences between the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly um, and bias, Rafi has a, has a book on the table. Where I saw that where there's a chapter, chapter about UN bias. The only thing I'll say is, um, to the extent that the UN is accused of bias, I would say there's no such thing as the UN. The UN General Assembly has passed many, many biased resolutions, and I would say most objective observers do consider the UN General Assembly biased. UNRWA um, and the UN Special Rapporteur for the Middle East, I would say most people consider them biased. But there are other bodies within the UN that are considered fairer. The UN Security Council is one of them because the United States has veto power, um, so that most, not all, most United Nations Security Council resolutions um, that are passed have the United States uh, holding Israel back, so to speak. Um, very briefly on two, UN 242 and 338, and again, these are the center of the conflict, certainly on the diplomatic and political levels, is the English version of UN Resolution 242 is not the same as the French version of UN Resolution 242. The English version says uh, that Israel, as part of the process of UN 242 being realized, that Israel needs to withdraw from territories. It doesn't say which or how much. That's to be defined basically in negotiations. The French version actually says, in French, from the territories. So sometimes when you have people arguing about what UN Resolution 242, it actually was intentionally done, my theory is and many other people's theory is, so that both sides, for everybody in order to sign on to UN 242 and the word end, they basically had two valid versions, so everybody could always argue uh, their side. But there certainly is uh, a valid side for Israel to say, uh, the English version says, from territories, not from the territories. What needs to be withdrawn from is completely undefined and basically part of negotiations. I'm going to move on to Oslo. Um, Oslo can be an argument uh, from itself. One could say that it supersedes everything that happens earlier. Okay? That basically, um, if you have a contract, you know, the overall law on an issue can say you have the following protections and the following rights. But two parties, bilaterally, can make a contract and say, I'm waiving these rights, I'm waiving these rights because we're making a deal together. So one argument is that uh, Oslo um, creates a new set of realities. Um, and the pro-legality of the settlements issue would say, look, um, that uh, Oslo is what we call in law lex specialis. Um, and that it replaced everything else, anything else that could have been in favor of the Palestinian side for arguing that the settlements were illegal. Now they're illegal, um, except as to you know, whatever we end up negotiating and giving away um, as part of the negotiating process, but that basically, other than that, um, they're illegal. Where, where are these arguments made from? There is an interim agreement from, the, uh, ninth, uh, from 1995, Article 18, Paragraph 1, the Palestinians commit that they don't exercise jurisdiction on the settlement's issue, pending permanent status negotiations. There's also no specific freeze or prohibition of construction, planning, or zoning of settlements. This is a big, big fight, um, again, in terms of intent and history. 
why wasn't it included, why it wasn't included, at the end of the day, it wasn't included. A very, very strong argument for the uh, uh, legality uh, of the settlement side is it wasn't included in the Oslo Accords, and a very strong uh, argument for the side that says uh, freezing is not required, it wasn't included in the Oslo Accords. On the other hand, Article 30, Paragraph 7 of the Interim Agreement of 1995 says, neither side will change the static status of the West Bank and Gaza pending permanent status negotiations. The Palestinians say this applies to mean no settlements allowed. Israel comes back and says, that's not what it meant. It meant no change to the legal status. It didn't say anything specific about the settlements. And the Palestinians say, well, we got a side letter in the 1991 Madrid Peace Conference from the United States and a 2008 uh, promise from uh, President Bush um, that the US believes that it does apply to the settlements. And we can argue about this back and forth uh, to the end of the world. Next, um, another argument from the other side that the settlements uh, have legal problems. Um, that there has been tons of unofficial understandings that only existing settlements uh, could be built. Um, and that uh, Israel hasn't acted in good faith, um, that we've agreed to specific freezes, that the fact that we've torn down outposts shows that we really understand that there's a legal problem. Um, the current report that has legal status for the Israeli government is the 2005 report by Talia Sasson, initiated by Prime Minister Sharon. Uh, that was actually approved by the government, and in that report it says 105 outposts are unauthorized, are illegal. Um, so that is used uh, by the other side. Um, and that there, the, the report also this says that there's no way, this is the Israeli government report, no way to validate retroactively those outposts built on private Palestinian land. Now this is why the Levy report was commissioned. The Levy report was commissioned basically in order to balance out the Talia Sasson report, so that the Israeli government could say, um, actually, if you look back at the pre-UN history and all of these other arguments that the Sasson report didn't get into, we could retroactively legalize settlements. This was one of the revolutionary ideas of the Levy report, was giving a legal basis to retroactively authorize settlements, or uh, sorry, outposts, which when they were built, didn't have official legal status, although there was usually a wink um, and sometimes lots of money flowing from government ministries for people to settle there. Um, there are a number of other arguments there that the Oslo Accords recognize mutual political rights, um, which would include the Palestinian sovereign rights, even if it didn't, even if Israel and the Jews hadn't agreed to that at an earlier date that that was agreed to in the Oslo Accords. Um, one thing with the Oslo Accords that's important is how do we to view two central, two central issues? One is the division of the West of the Judea and Samaria into Area A, B, and C. Area A is where the Palestinians have civil and security control. Area B, they have only civil control. And Area C, there's still full Israeli control. Did that mean, to some extent, that we were recognizing Palestinian sovereign and political rights? Or did it mean that uh, basically um, we have complete uh, control certainly over Area C and maybe rights over Area A and B until there's a final status agreement signed. Um, under the interim agreements, Israel maintained all powers over security and foreign relations regarding Judea and Samaria, as well as any other power not explicitly transferred to the Palestinian Council. That's another argument for the pro-legality of the settlement side from the Oslo Accords. Um, and I'm going to, from there, move on to the, the last, uh, one of the last sections, which has to do with the most current stuff, Palestinian statehood. Again, not full statehood, because the UN Security Council hasn't given it to them, but a number of UN agencies have already recognized Palestine. Most countries in the world have recognized Palestine. Um, the major 2004 ruling of the International Court of Justice about the illegality of Israel's wall in Judea and Samaria, which the Israeli High Court rejected. I'm going to briefly re uh, review that. Um, and the International Criminal Court, why does all of that matter? Which is maybe one of the main reasons why international law matters a lot more today, even than it ever did before. OK, the 2004 uh, ICJ, International Court of Justice decision, three main points that the Judea and Samaria are, are occupied territory because Jordan was a state party when it was taken, and the territory was acquired by war. And the fact that Jordan renounced the rights is not relevant. 
That's number one. That's what the ICJ says. Number two, that the Palestinians' claim is based on the super duper powerful whole international law principle of self determination, um, and that inherently gives them uh, uh, rights to the area. And number three, that the Fourth Geneva Convention does prohibit actions which either organize or even encourage Jews to move there, not just coercive moves like the Nazis. The Israeli High Court did something fascinating to reject this opinion without fully rejecting this opinion because the Israeli High Court says it accepts International Court of Justice opinions as guidance, basically. So in two, uh, decisions in 2004 and 2005 said, look, we're not going to deal with whether Judea and Samaria are occupied or not. That's the first issues off the table. We're not going to deal with whether the Palestinians have the right to self-determination or not. That's the second big uh, thing that was issued. And we're not going to deal with whether the Fourth Geneva applies to Jewish construction for political purposes um, or to colonize. But what we will say is that according to Israeli law, according to Israeli law, that construction of the wall in order to build more settlements would be illegal, but to build the wall for security reasons is legal. Basically what they said is, we're not dealing with any of the legal principles that you ruled on. We're just saying, as a factual matter, you, the ICJ, found that the purpose of this wall as a factual matter was to colonize Judea and Samaria. We disagree with you. We don't think the purpose was to colonize Judea and Samaria. The Israeli High Court said we think the purpose was security. And if the purpose was security, it's legal. So this is, uh, we were talking about uh, legal gymnastics. The Israeli High Court was able to continue to recognize the ICJ guidance while basically rejecting most of the findings, legal findings that the ICJ made. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, so that there's uh, time for questions. There's a lot more to say about uh, that ICJ ruling. There's more to say about IDF uh, laws. There's more to, s more to say about many uh, rulings of the Israeli High Court. I was going to read the, the text of a couple of them, but one important one to know is the, uh, the big dis uh, Israeli High Court decision on the withdrawal of the Gaza Strip. There was a petition to block the, uh, the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, and an 11-justice High Court uh, panel, 10 voted not to grant the petition. The withdrawal obviously took place. One judge voted uh, to block it, um, and that was Edmund Levy, who later authored uh, the report. So I was asked beforehand by somebody, why hasn't the Levy report been adopted? Uh, it is very clear that the legal community uh, in Israel, by virtue of, if you have 11 justices, 10 of them, uh, were on one side and Edmund Levy was on the other side, that the legal community in Israel is not a big fan of the Levy report. I'm not going to say that that applies to all lawyers. Obviously it doesn't. Uh, you know, Alan Baker and Takeda Shapiro are very serious uh, legal jurists and there are other uh, big supporters. But that's, uh, somebody asked me why. Uh, that's part of uh, the framework. Um, and finishing with the International Criminal Court. Can settlements today be war crimes? Not just illegal, but can they be war crimes? Could people be dragged in front of the International Criminal Court for supporting the settlement enterpri enterprise, for making the settlements happen? So the first thing we need to talk about that for there is, is there Palestinian statehood? Okay? Israel waged its first legal battle, which I uh, had the privilege to be involved in and, uh, when I was still on the government side, um, from 2009 to April 2012, a successful legal battle blocking the state of Palestine from joining the International Criminal Court. Okay, so it was a three and a half year battle. Briefs were filed by all sorts of NGOs, governments, um, and in the end the International Criminal Court said, look, you can't come to us because you're not a state yet. If you're only, only states can file cases in the International Criminal Court. The big problem is that after that big win, the UN General Assembly on November 29th, 2012 recognized the state of Palestine as a, as a member, a non-member state, but as a member. Um, since then, the state of Palestine has joined a range of UN conventions. Um, and that means that they suddenly have a stronger argument for going to the International Criminal Court. Now, will the Palestinians actually join? If they do try to join, they could get nailed for war crimes themselves, right? So this is uh, a whole separate thing that people want to ask about this also. We were talking, I'm talking about the settlements, but there was a big report that the IDF uh, came out with last week about uh, the IDF's own internal investigations of alleged war crimes in the summer Gaza war. If people want to ask about that, that's fine. Um, 
if you know, the IDF was being, you know, in Israel was being attacked for war crimes, whether on settlements or because of what happened in Gaza in summer 2012, Hamas and Fatah potentially would also be on the hook. Every time you fire a rocket indiscriminately at civilians, it could be a war crime. Um, so will the Palestinians really join it? What we've seen recently is that tons of NGOs and supporters of uh, the Palestinians, I'm almost done, um, are pushing the Palestinians to join, and Abu Mazen doesn't seem to want to join because he seems to realize that he doesn't want to be on the hook, and he doesn't want, uh, well, I mean, he might want Hamas to be on the hook, but uh, the Palestinian side also doesn't want to be on the hook. The other big defense that Israel would have, I mean, there is a number of them, but uh, we could go on for another 20 minutes, is what's the, the, the fancy f phrase called complementarity. Um, Basically, it all, all it means is that as long as Israel investigates war crimes allegations, it doesn't have to indict, it doesn't have to convict. As long as it does reasonable investigations of war crimes allegations, the International Criminal Court is not allowed to get involved. The ICC can only get involved when a country doesn't investigate or does a uh, kangaroo court style investigation not investigating seriously. Um, so, very brief comments. I said at the end that I would give um, predictions. Again, I'm not saying what I think should happen, and I don't have any crystal, b crystal ball. Nothing seems to be happening immediately, but it does appear that the tide of history and uh, the movement of the parties, including the Likud party itself, including the movement of the still current Prime Minister Netanyahu, is that there's going to at some point be land for peace on a larger level. Whether it's in five years or 50 years, I have no idea. I don't think anybody else does. So why does international law matter? First of all, it matters because of the International Criminal Court. If we have arguments to defend all sorts of accusations in the International Criminal Court, we can save people from getting into international war crimes. It's a very serious body, the International Criminal Court. There's over 120 countries that are signed on, and somebody who is convicted of a war crime basically could be unable to travel in Europe, in uh, all sorts of... Uh, a large part of the world where they might uh, want, want to travel. Um, we've seen already there have been attempts to arrest Israeli officials. Imagine if over 120 countries were part of that and were obligated to be part of that because of signing the convention. So it's a big deal, international law, in terms of what could be argued in the court. And the other thing is, if we do come down into an argument about land for peace and debating, percentages, who gets this village, who gets that village, you know, exactly how much is going to be given up, to the extent that Israel has um, put together the most robust international arguments, when you get on the fence there of whether this village or this area is going to stay part of Israel or part of Palestine, the stronger the legal arguments you have, the more moral high ground you have, which at least according to friendly countries like the United States, some Western European countries can make a difference. Um, happy to take questions. Yes. Um, so 